I could sit here and talk all day about why you should garden, why we should garden, everything, but I'm gonna just focus on three reasons why we garden here at the school. Um, the first and most obvious reason is it's um, beneficial for our health. Um, we, gardening is not just a way to provide food, but it's also exercise. So when we're out in the garden, we're not just picking flowers, we are running around, using shovels, digging, we're out in the sun all day, so we're getting vitamin D. Um, it's a really <coughs> great way to exercise, and that's important because this generation of children is um, predicted to be one of the first generations of children that dies before their parents, like die, basically, because of obesity. And um, that's a huge public health issue, and there's a lot of different ways to amend it, but when easy way is just to get your kids outside and a wonderful way to get your kids outside is to guard it. Um, kids love gardening. And another obvious reason why it's healthy is gardening provides fresh fruits and vegetables for your family and for children. Um, the majority of adults in America do not eat vegetables. Um, they don't like vegetables. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Well, I, I kind of have some theories, but um, they just don't. And so it's hard, especially as adults, to start new habits. And so one reason that we wanted to garden here at the school is to get them started young. And um, for example, like my husband, he hates most vegetables, you know, and when we got married, that's like very different for me. Like I ate a lot of vegetables growing up and I like trying new things. And so I just had to keep, you know, introducing things to him kind of like you would to a small child. And it's actually, it's actually proven that if you, um, that a child or an adult needs to be exposed to something three or more times for them to be, become used to it. When you introduce something new to a child, it's very scary. Um, they're like, oh my goodness, something new. I mean, if you can see this, if you change any part of their routine, they're like, ah, why are my shoes not where they need to be? Or, you know, like, it's, um, it can be scary. So when you introduce okra for the first time or green beans for the first time, of course their first reaction is, I don't want this, you know, and they'll ignore it or throw it on the floor or throw it at you. Um, and so gardening is a great way to expose children to those vegetables and those fruits. And, um, and it's surprising how very um, receptive they are to it. So last year, one of our biggest crops that we brought in was kale. And I was like, oh my gosh, like everything else died that I kind of thought that the kids would enjoy more, like the cilantro died, the radishes, we had like a small crop of radishes. And so like the whole garden was kale. It's like the kids aren't gonna like this. And, but we tried, you know, we tried it. They all tried it, pieces of it, you know, just like fresh kale and then we cooked it here and um, a lot of kids liked it. A lot of kids, I was very surprised at how many kids ate the kale. Um, and I have a beautiful infographic about like just kind of the proportions of how much vegetables and fruit to animal products that we eat. So all of this here is animal product of some sort that we eat compared to the amount of fruits and vegetables that we eat. And then of course we have our favorite corn syrup and <laughs> wheat and flour that we eat. And then like um, this includes, I like this one, it's like 20 pounds of French fries that we eat per year, 23 pounds of pizza that we eat per year, um, 24 pounds of ice cream and so on and so forth. Um, it's, we as Americans are not very healthy. So, um, and, and it gets kids excited about gardening. So when you grow something from seed, you're not just watching it grow, even that in itself is beautiful and miraculous, but you are experiencing it and you're making a relationship with this plant. And so the kids watch it, they grow it from seed, they watch it each step of its growth, and then they're, you know, the final destination is being able to eat it. And so um, it, they learn so much from that and it's uh, growing your own food, it really helps you and your family to eat healthier and of course it makes it more available in your kitchen. Your kids are more likely to eat it because they grew it, you know. And I have another cute little infographic. So again, the people are eating, like this is how much the intake below recommendation or above, uh, yeah, so this is the intake, this is how, sorry, I forgot what it means. <laughs> so this is like how many people 
are b below the recommended intake amount of vegetables. And this is how many people eat more than they should. So this is how many people eat less than they should, and this is how many people eat more than they should. And if you can see, it's very like lopsided for fruits and vegetables. And then if you look at protein foods like meats, um, they eat a lot more, the recommendation, a lot more than what's recommended for them to eat. Um, and of course, saturated fats, sodium, added sugars, all of our favorite um, foods, of course. And um, so yeah, so that's just one like major reason why we should garden. Um, another uh, wonderful reason to garden is it's educational. When we're out in the garden, we're not, again, we're not just planting a seed and that's it. Like, it doesn't end there. Um, when we're in the garden, your children are botanists, they are entomologists, um, sometimes we're zoologists, depending on if we find a bird in the garden. <laughs> like, this week we found a baby bird. And we talked about, you know, the bird's life cycle and how we need to stay away from the, you know, the nest. And so um, we learn all kinds of different types of science. And, and it's not limited to just the gardening classes. Um, our life science class does a lot of work in the garden. In fact, um, the primary way that I teach um, the scientific method is in the garden. We, I allow them to make their own experiments. Um, and they have to test a certain variable using like one type of plant. So let's say they uh, want to test how well a bean plant grows in the sun versus in the shaded area. So it's a very simple experiment, but when you're working on the scientific method, they have to come up with a hypothesis. They have to create every step to their experiment. So that's um, one way that we learn in the garden, one way that we use um, the garden for science. Another way in biology, in our high school biology class, the garden provides like an excellent space for us to um, you know, learn the different types of plants there are. So just uh, last week and two weeks ago, we were studying angiosperms and gymnosperms and the difference between like a flowering plant and a non-flowering plant. So a, a gymnosperm would be your like pine trees, you know, that's a non-flowering plant that produces seeds. Um, whereas an angiosperm would be a flowering plant that produces seeds also, right? So they both produce seeds, one is flowering, one's not. So there's a lot of different types of angiosperms that we grow in the garden. Most, um, most fruits that we produce, are, well, they're all, all fruits that we produce are angiosperms because they all produce a flower. Um, so that's um, another way that we learn. And I always say, in, especially in the high school class, you know, science is not our theology, science is not our religion, and our, science is like our feeble attempt to explain the wonderful phenomena that God has created, us, created for us. And it's like, where else, is, where else are we going to learn about that other than outside in his creation? Um, another thing that we've been doing a lot this couple of months is our garden's been under the construction, so we've been just learning that, you know, gardening is more than just having a place and having, like, a structured environment for gardening, but also gardening can be in the field. So we have our beautiful field, and we've learned it's a little bit of foraging. You know, God has planted some things for us, and so we can, you know, harvest that as well. So we have edible flowers, like dandelions and wine cups, and there's lots of edible weeds. I haven't learned all of them yet. We also found we had a mulberry tree this semester, which was really awesome, and a musket and grapevine. So the kids learn all about that in gardening, life science, and biology. Um, let's see. The third reason that we have a garden is because literally from the beginning of time, gardens have been God's plan for us. Um, Genesis 2, 8, 17 says, um, then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man he formed. Besides this, God caused every tree beautiful to the sight and good for food to grow from the ground. Then the Lord God took the man he formed and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded Adam, saying, you may eat food from every tree in the garden, except for, you know, <laughs> that one tree. <laughs> um, I often think about what our state would have been like before the fall of Adam and Eve. And uh, while the Bible offers you know, a scant amount of details of our pre-fallen state, it does point out that we had a close communion with God while we were in the Garden of Eden. And when we were cast out, we had a lot more struggles. And we had to struggle a lot more to maintain this closeness to God. So 
One way to maintain this closeness to God is to attempt to recreate our pre-fallen environment, such as creating a garden. So we're not just creating plants or planting something. We are nourishing a life outside of our own. We're creating beauty. We are becoming more disciplined and more nurturing. And we're not only growing a plant, but growing in our love for Christ and all of his creation. So that's just my first part. And then the next part uh-oh, is what can gardening look like? So just like you would customize your diet or exercise plan to fit the needs of yourself and your family, your garden can and should be customized to what you have. Um, you would not grow eggplant if you despise eggplant. Um, <laughs> we grow okra here, and that was a struggle, but you know, some kids were like, what the heck is this? Because <laughs> a lot of kids have never seen it, you know, it grows really tall. But we tried it, and some kids, of course, spit it out, and some kids were like, wow, fresh okra is really awesome. You know, we pickled it and tried it different ways. Um, you wouldn't grow pumpkins if you live in an apartment. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so there's just a lot of different, you wouldn't ever grow it um, according, you know, you grow it to what you have, right? So there's a lot of different gardens, and no two gardens are the same, and we have a garden here, and I'll talk about why we do the garden here the way we do it, but first I wanted to go through a diff couple different types of gardens you can have. I was reading about victory gardens during World War II. I thought that was really cool how, like, the government was like, garden, garden, we need more food, you know, our rations are low, and um, it's estimated that there was like 20 million tons of food produced during that that era, you know, during that year or two years that it was going on. And then afterwards, it just stopped. And there was like, it just, people stopped tending to their gardens. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, so the one that's really interesting, and these are really popular right now, is the aquaponics garden. So you have like your fish tank, and your plants use the nutrients, like the poop of your fish. And um, this is really interesting because it's good for like cities. If you have a small apartment like I do, you can have your fish tank and grow lettuce or oregano or thyme or something in a little, right? And so basically the idea is um, they don't really have roots, or they have roots, sorry. They don't have soil. <coughs> They're using the nutrients that the fish creates. And some people actually do both. They use this as a way to, um, a way to produce fish and a way to produce vegetables. So it can be like two part. You can have like a fish garden or a fish farm and a garden. So that's, I think this is a really cool plan, especially for like if you're thinking futuristic, you know, you save a lot of money on soil and um, it can be done inside. Um, this is hydroponics. This is another really popular way to garden right now. This one is basically aquaponics without the fish. So, <laughs> so they have, this is like one really, um, this is like an amazing garden that has, you know, they produce, you know, tons and tons of pounds of tomatoes every year. So they have, they add nutrients to the water, and it's a pump that pumps it through. And this isn't really soil. It's more like a, maybe like a pebbly substance that they, you know, they can drain the water through. And the, if this is a bunch of lettuce that you can grow. So, yeah. So this is another way to garden. Again, if you have space, hydroponics can be really cool. If you have small space. Like, they are using a giant greenhouse. But you can do this in your you know, in your apartment. It's not that difficult. Another um, space-saving one for apartments is this tower, and um, our PE coach here is actually telling me about it the other day. This is um, a garden tower, is all it's called, and so what you would do here is you would put the nutrients and the water down the center, and there would be soil here, and then you just plant things in these little pockets, and they're said to, like, produce a lot. You don't have to weed. Um, you probably don't have a lot of pest problems because it's not all di directly in the in the in the ground. Um, so yeah, all of those three are good for space. You know, you don't have a lot of space, and maybe not a lot of time. You just need something simple, and you want a garden, right? Um, this is kind of my how you know I like the garden to look like. More. <laughs> this is like a permaculture design where they kind of plant everything together to create like an ecosystem. Um, so everything's kind of together. You got your flowering trees. You got some fruit trees. You got um, different things here. So this is a, also a really cool permaculture infographic. So you can see that there. Whenever we think about permaculture, when we think about gardening. It's not just we're just trying to plant one plant or um, what they call it a monoculture, which is 
what a lot of um, massive farms do today is they just have um, monocultures, which is really bad for the soil. It's um, one of the causes of the dust bowl. Um, it's also, it's, I mean, you don't get a variety of foods in the, in the markets either if you just do monocultures. And it's not good for the environment. So here, we're not just thinking about one thing. Look, we have places for the fungi, we have places for our little plants and our little animals. <coughs> um, and it's just kind of, it creates like a big ecosystem, right? So this is kind of what I, I try to go for in our garden. It's also fun for the kids because they have a lot of things to play with. Um, this is one I'm learning about right now. It's called the it's called a tree guild. This is a specific type, but the tree guild um, or the forest guild, it's um, you you plant in layers. So you have different layers of plants. You have your your top layer, which is probably they have a fruit tree, but you can have even a higher layer where it's like a nut tree, like a pecan. So you'd have a pecan tree that would be your highest layer, your tallest layer. Then you'd have a fruit tree that would be a lower layer, and then you would have maybe some bushes like this. Um, uh, like uh, blueberry bushes, stuff like that would be maybe your medium layer. And then you would have maybe your bottom layers, your root vegetables, herbs. Um, then you have some vining plants. So like you're creating different layers. And that's, uh, that's a forest guild. Um, that's all, it's very similar. It's, it's based off of the same ideas as permaculture where it's, not, it's less about growing like one type of thing and more about creating an environment that plants will grow in easily. And it's like le a little bit less upkeep in some ways, but more upkeep in other ways. Um, and then everyone's favorite, clean cut, raised beds. We got some wood raised beds. These are really nice with some, it looks like uh, cabbage. And, and then these are also really cute. I like those, um, the cinder block <coughs> raised beds. And the, those are beautiful. And these also are great if you have the space, right? So both this one and the other one, they take up a lot of space. Um, so yeah, and you got your tomatoes and stuff like that. Um, oh. Okay, so next part is what gardening? Oh wait, well I wanted to talk about just like a couple of things. Like if you wanted to start your garden at home, like things that you need to consider beforehand. So you would want to consider, um, you want to consider the amount of sunlight that you receive. So I live in an apartment and I get I have a giant oak tree in front of my apartment patio, so I get like no sunlight. Um, so I can grow things like lettuce and kale and onions, and that's pretty much it. Maybe some root vegetables, but not a lot, um, and some flowers. But if I wanted to eat it, I mean, I could grow some edible flowers. Um, what else could be? So, and then if you have like a lot of space, you want to make sure that like what you're planting is not going to be shaded by anything like big trees or houses and stuff like that. So whatever you plant, you have to think about how much sunlight does it receive. So out in the garden, we just planted um, all of our vegetables. And the reason like we put the garden so far out is because I don't want it to be really close to any trees or any buildings that could shade out the morning sun, which is actually like the most beneficial sun to your plants because the, the heat, the hot, the heat of the afternoon sun can actually hurt and scorch some plants. Um, so the morning sun is like the most important sun. Um, so let's see. Um, and then the amount of space that you have, of course, we talked about the space. So if you live in an apartment, again, you can't plant a lot of pumpkins. But if you live and you have a big yard, then you can plant, you know, depending on what you want, anything you want if you have the sun and the space. Um, and then nearness to water source. So if you are someone who's a lazy gardener, you definitely want to be close to a water source. Um, last year when we were setting up the garden, I sacrificed closeness to a water source so that I could have the right amount of sun. And I just kind of compensated by that by saying, well, the children need something to do. <laughs> they need to water the garden. They can go to the water source and bring it back. Um, and then soil. So you need to have the right type of soil. Um, a and M, Texas A and M. If you send your soil sample to Texas A and M, they will actually tell you like what's in your soil. They'll tell you the pH of your soil. They'll um, and then if you're if you tell them what you want to plant in that soil, they'll actually tell you how you can amend your soil. So they can tell you like what you need more of. So you know we need nitrogen. Our soil, a lot of plants need nitrogen. You know potassium, potash. They need a lot of different nutrients. So depending on what you're growing. So. Um, <coughs> And then how do we garden with children? So and what does that look like? So one thing, um, 
our garden here at school is different than I think what you would do at home with your children, but I think I, it's, it's good to kind of have the idea. So gardening with children never looks like what we think it's going to look like. Oh, that, that's not supposed to be that way, but I fixed it, and then it unfixed itself. <laughs> so this is, some, this is the children. We, I said, let's mulch the garden with leaves, and it became a leaf party. So sometimes gardening with children isn't what we think. So the way I have it set up here is we have, um, if, um, I've kind of taken some of the methods from the Montessori schooling where the Montessori says, well, let's give them certain tools, let's teach them how to use these tools or, these, or teach them how to, this certain skill, and then allow them to practice that skill over and over again as many times as they want. So I try to use similar things in the garden. Um, so I provide them with tools like shovels and magnifying glasses and um, you know the hand forks and clippers and I show them how to use it and then I try to give them like as much freedom as possible and um, this freedom like encourages them to explore the garden uninterrupted which is really important for children to learn you know they need that time in their heads to figure out okay I'm gonna pick this okra and this is how I'm gonna pick it and you know they're gonna do it that way. Um, so at the beginning of class, I'll usually give them reminders, you know, we definitely need a water, we definitely need a weed, but then after that, you can do whatever you want that's within the tasks of the garden. Um, so just trying to like give them something like ownership of the garden. Um, and that's another reason that I don't really want raised beds, because I feel like raised beds makes it too easy on the children. If the children want to make their own beds, um, then we should provide the tools for them. But if we give them raised beds already, then really it will just become a garden where you put the seed in, watch it grow, then it's like done, you know? So it's a reason why we kind of leave everything on the ground and we plant everything directly into the ground. It's, um, it just makes, it makes things a little more complicated. And in some ways with children that's better because it gives them more things to do. It's also very easy for them to see. So if we're planting, you know, a tomato plant that's going to grow you know, three feet tall, three or four feet tall, and get really bushy. If it's already raised like two feet, then there's no way a kindergartner or pre-K student is going to be able to reach that top tomato plant. You know, that top little you know cherry tomato. Um, and so that's how it is with okra. That's how it is with a lot of plants. So we want to make the garden like as accessible to children as possible. Um, so yeah, so that's how we do it here at the school. So I make watering. I don't have an irrigation system. They have to water it all by hand. Um, they, you know, catch the insects by hand. And of course, we don't use any insecticides or yeah, any kind of pesticides at all, or any kind of um, any kind of poisons in the in the garden. We don't use any of that. Um, we try to find like the most natural remedies as possible. So if we have a pest, it's their job to catch all the pests and kill them, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is actually like their like the highlight of some of their days. Is like I'm gonna catch all the cucumber beetles I can, and, and we have like an executioning block like where they take it and they have like two stones where they smash it together, and we have some really and then you know being able to identify between a cucumber beetle and a a ladybug is very it's difficult because they do they they're both roundish shaped bugs with black dots on it right so a ladybug is red a cucumber beetle can be orange green or yellow um, so we have to be able to identify the two because we love ladybugs we hate cucumber beetles <laughs> um, and just allowing them to like have that freedom to recognize it I've also created um, some like picture books with the common insects in our garden so that they can try to identify it themselves. Um, so again, like if you're at home, you can try to make things like as accessible to the children as possible and um, do so also with books and like pictures, you know, and if they can't, not all of them can really read all the words yet. So that's why I like to use big pictures and we usually go through it beforehand and say, this is our, this is our insect book. Sometimes we just have children that want to sit and just look at the insect book the whole time and just like look what's this insect can we find this one you know and so that's um that's a lot of fun um so we have a different, couple of different pictures okay so here is we we were picking some okra here and here we have our magnifying glass so we have we used to have a, like a lot of logs in the garden which are really great places <laughs> for insects to hide and little garden snakes 
Um, so they can just, and, and termites, which is I think what Jude is looking at right now. He's looking at a bunch of little termites because they're like, oh my gosh, it's ants. And I was like, no, it's termites. You know, they're not going to hurt us. They just want to eat our wood. So he's just looking at the termites. And then what else do we have? Oh, there's a cool picture of them all doing stuff. So I kind of, I will also work while they're working so that if, you know, I'm in the garden, but I don't want to be like, watching every single thing that they do because I don't, I'm not like the overseer, I'm, you know, like a, the slave master. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm working with them. It's like a joint effort. Um, yeah, so that's some things that we do in our garden. These are, this is our basil from last year, which we just had so much of. We were just decorating the whole school with, um, and that was actually an accident. So we gave, <laughs> so the little kids, we, I had split them into groups and I made like the older kids in charge of the seeds for that group. And um, one day, like the sixth and fifth graders were absent for some reason. I think they were working in music. And so they thought it would be okay just to give like the third and fourth graders this bag of seeds. And so um, the first thing that our, our fourth grader did was give all the little kids the bags of seeds. And so the kindergartners, of course, their style of gardening is just, woohoo, I want to plant flowers and basil everywhere. So we just kind of had this patch that we weren't sure what was planted there. And, um, but I didn't wanna, you know, we had so many seeds there, so we kind of just like made, we kind of roped it off with some like stones and sticks. So we weren't allowed to step there, but we were also weren't sure what was actually gonna grow. We ended up with a forest of flowers, basil, some tomato plants, and I think a watermelon, you know? And so, and it, it turned out really great. Like it was a really beautiful part of our garden. So again, let's look. Gardening looks like with children is just kind of, it, we, yeah, we want it to be very organized and very, this is how gardening should be. And, um, but it's not, that's not always how it is with children. You have to allow them, maybe if you want your own garden, you're like, well, this is mommy's garden, this is my garden, and this over here can be where you play and plant whatever you want and play. And sometimes it's just digging holes. They love digging holes. So, but gardening can come in many shapes and forms. Um, so I think that is it. So yes, we should all garden. Are there any questions about gardening that you guys might have? Um, I have a little activity for us if we have time. Do we have time? Yes, Shane. Uh, so what did you and uh, you do wrong? What do you think uh, that you would do good? Like what you would like to do wrong in order to like be good at gardening? What would you suggest that I would do? Like, I've heard you like you do like this. Like, no. Do not start with tomatoes if you've never gardened before. <laughs> That's not a great place to start. I would start with something really simple and something small that you can just get used to taking care of. Kind of like, you know, when you're a child and your mom's like, you're like, I want a puppy, I want a puppy. When your mom's like, okay, wait, hold up, let's get like a hamster first. You know, let's, let's see if the fish will survive. So it's kind of the same idea. So I would start with something that's hard to kill. Um, mint. If you live, depending on where you, like what you do, <laughs> mint won't disappoint you. It's hard to kill, it'll invade everything. And it's, it smells very nice, you can eat it, you can dry it and make tea. Um, yeah, I would start with mint. You can also, you know, I work right next door to you so you can come and talk to me about it if you want. <laughs> I can, uh, yeah. But if you live, I think you live in an apartment, so I would just start with something small, like some mint. Succulents. Oh yeah, cactus. I'm very, um, sometimes in my gardening I can be a little too utilitarian. Like I really want to grow things that I can use and eat, you know, but cactuses can be also beautiful and easy things to grow. Succulents. Yes. Aloe vera, Aloe vera is useful, yeah. Yes. Yeah, propagation. Yes. Um, it's kind of just an experiment. Like, <laughs> um, if you want to take cuttings, like again, mint is something you can just cut off and stick it in a pot, water the pot, and it will grow. In fact, if you want some mint, Shane, I can give you some mint. It just depends on what you're propagating. So um, I found that mint does that, oregano does that. Um, uh, what else is it? Rosemary, rosemary will do that. And you can stick it in like maybe a cup of water for a little bit. So what you do is like, like if you're picking rosemary, you would take your rosemary, um, pick off a lot of the bottom leaves and maybe leave like a tiny little bush at the top. Let it sit in water, like let the stem sit in water for maybe a day or two so that it gets kind of softened and 
and then stick it in water and keep the, or stick it in soil and keep the soil, excuse me, keep the soil moist, really moist. And then it should grow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So if you want it, so if you leave it in the water, it should grow roots still. Like rosemary and oregano and a lot of the herbs will grow roots, and then you'll just have a water plant. Now you can't take that, those roots that it's grown, and stick that into soil and expect it to grow, because those roots that have grown are grown like they're used to the water. They're grown specifically for like using water as their like nutrients and using whatever's in the water. Kind of like the hydroponics and the aquaponics. Like you can't just add soil to that and they would have to start all over and create new roots. So that's why you'd only stick it in water for like a day or two to soften it up. And the reason that you like pull the leaves off is because that area that you pull the leaves off, it's like called the like apical meristem basically. It's like where the point of growth in your plants. So that's, you know, if it's not growing, you can stimulate it to grow um, roots instead of growing leaves, right? So you wouldn't leave it in the water for a long time. I have some that I've left in the water by the windowsill, and, like, I have a thyme plant that's just, like, it's not, like, the most beautiful thing in the world, but it, it's surviving, you know? <laughs> and I can clip from it every once in a while. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, what are those... What is that one that you have on your windowsill now? The yeah, it's just you can just pick it off and it'll grow roots, and you can put it in water and it'll grow a bunch of roots. Yeah, that will live, that won't die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I'm curious about the cinder blocks. Oh, um, yeah, the cinder blocks. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can plant, so what they recommend if you want to do that is to plant, like, herbs in the, in the holes because it, it is um, a cinder block, so it, it, it can get heated. And the herbs actually like the heat. You know, think of, you know, rosemary and basil growing in, you know, the Middle East or in Greece and stuff like that where it, gets, it can get pretty hot, right? So they would, you would grow that in the cent in the, around the edges and then grow whatever you want in the center, right? So you could just stack them. Yeah, no, it's such a large space, it wouldn't affect it as much. Yeah. Again, I mean, it depends on what you're growing. Yeah, so, I, like, my dream here is to have, like, our own soil, where we make our own soil in the compost. So that's something that we do with the kids. It's, like, we compost, and, I mean, you guys bring us all your decaying vegetables and everything. That's what we're doing with them is we're making soil out of it. So in the future, that's the best stuff. And like um, here I have some beautiful smelling compost tea, which we made using like banana peels and worm castings, which is just worm poo. And we let it sit in water for like a couple of days. And then um, it's fertilizer. It has nitrogen and it has potash. It has like a lot of really great things. So before we plant anything, we spray something and we put it in the ground and then cover so anytime you plant something, you put that. Um, I mean, it, just, it really depends on what you're growing. Yeah, I mean, if you're growing vegetables, you're going to need a lot of nitrogen. But again, it depends on what type of vegetables. Like, you know, <laughs> some like it more acidic, some like it less acidic. And that really depends. But I mean, fertilizer, homemade fertilizer is the best. Mm -hmm. And you can just make this with banana peels. You don't need anything else. So like, if you just want to buy El Cheapo soil, then making your fertilizer is, you know, really good because it's also free. You can go where you bought the bananas. <coughs> so, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, it, no, no, you and it and when you open it, it's gonna smell pretty bad. So prepare yourself. Um, in fact, <laughs> my my sixth graders, because that's who we did um, the compost tea with, they t they, they fondly nicknamed it turd tea. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, we had a couple different mixtures. We had one that was just banana peels in the water, and the water kind of turns like this milky yellow. And then um, we had some with the worm castings and banana peels and other things, like eggshells also you can put in there. 
Um, and you just let him sit. It's like some people say, okay, let him sit for like a couple of days. We kind of accidentally let our sit for like three months, four months. So they got real fermented and um, tasty. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, do we have time to do an activity? Do we, what time is it anyway? Oh, no. Yeah, okay, we'll do, we, we can just do it later or not at all. Well, it's okay, so that's, that's that. Any other questions? I actually took a lot longer than I thought.